Having a world record is a pretty great achievement. Having a world record that's mathematically unbeatable is even better. Today I'm going to show you some world record surfaces, which are part of the field of algebraic geometry. And that topic is really a way to connect equations with the beautiful shapes that they correspond to. Mathematicians have always been eager to visualize their work and get an idea of what an equation looks like. Without computers around, they went to great lengths to calculate lots of values and used plaster, wire and paper to handcraft those models. World record surfaces are particularly baffling shapes that stand out because of their number of singularities. I'll get to what that means in just a bit, but first let's take a look at how an equation forms any shape at all. This is a free program called Surfer, derived from the word surface. There's a link to it down in the description. It allows us to visualize the shapes from equations in real time. More precisely, those equations are polynomials in the three variables x, y, and z. We don't have to worry about logarithms, roots, or negative exponents here. Algebraic geometry cares about sufficiently nice equations. Let's take a look at the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 1 is equal to 0. Having Pythagoras in mind, the solution here are just those points that are a distance of 1 from the origin. And indeed, we can see a perfect sphere on our screen. If I rotate the sphere around, you can't even notice. This is because of its perfect symmetry. And we can see that this symmetry is anchored in the equation already. We do the same thing to x, y, and z, which is raising the variable to the power of 2 and adding them all up. We can't distinguish between the variables in terms of mathematical operations, so we wouldn't expect to see anything unsymmetric in this picture. But let's try and break the symmetry. We can keep x squared plus y squared and just write minus z squared. So we still can't differ between x and y, but something should happen in the z direction. And lucky enough, that's exactly what we see. This double cone is still symmetric in the x and y directions, but we see a different story when we look up and down. But there is something else going on here. You can see that very spiky point in the middle. Well, this is what we refer to as a singularity. If the first thing that pops into your mind upon hearing the word singularity is a black hole or the movie Interstellar, then you're on a great path to becoming a physicist. In more abstract mathematics, this term could mean a lot of different things and usually describes points where something interesting happens. It is more than good enough for this video to keep thinking of that double cone intersection when you hear the word singularity. For those of you eager for a more technical definition, these points have vanishing partial derivatives. Now how do these singularities relate to the world records we spoke about before? Well, it wouldn't really make sense to just try and find the most amount of singularities because there wouldn't really be a limit. Instead, what is quite a natural question is to ask, how many singularities can you find for a given degree of a polynomial equation? The degree just counts how many variables get multiplied together in each term of the equation. For example, the degree of our sphere, or our double cone, would be 2, since two variables get multiplied in the terms. The degree of x times y times z equals 0 would therefore be 3. If two terms have different amounts of those variables, the degree would be the bigger number, so x squared times y times z plus z squared has a degree of 4, and so on. As it turns out, the double cone is already a world record surface itself, as it turns out that you cannot have more than one singularity for degree 2. But what about higher degrees? Mathematicians asked themselves this exact question for centuries, and yet we still only know the exact number of singularities up to degree 6. So there are still lots of records still to be snatched out there, and it might just be one of you watching now who gets one. 
Mathematicians have been able to sort of sandwich the maximal number of singularities a surface of a given degree could have via examples for the lower bound and some more abstract arguments for the upper bound. And it's finally time to get to the star of this video. A surface of degree 6, simply called a sextic, that cannot be bettered, the Bath sextic. 6 is currently the highest degree for which an unbeatable record exists, and the history of this surface is quite interesting. It's a surface that really shouldn't be possible. Here are two research papers by well-known Italian mathematicians, one from 1946 and one from 1982. They both went through a thorough review process for the reputable journals they were published in. The older paper claims that the maximum number of singularities for a sextic is 52, while the other one claims it is 64. Yet, they are both wrong. They're wrong because the Bath sextic, published in 1996, 16 years after the second paper, actually has 65 singularities. One is quick to think that something mathematically proven would outlast any debate, However, since we're human after all, we consider a mathematical proof correct if we don't find any mistakes in it. In the same year as Bath introduced his new shape to the world, two other researchers proved that 66 singularities wasn't possible, making Bath's record unbeatable, at least if there are no mistakes this time. So let's first take a look at the equation for this Bath sextic. It is said to enclose in its symmetric frame many hundred years of geometrical insight and skill. We can see that the first part has three factors that are quadratic in the variables, hence we have a term of degree 6 there, ignoring phi which is a constant. The second term looks familiar, we just have the formula of our sphere, squared and multiplied with some other number. The mysterious number phi in this equation is actually the famous golden ratio. If you are somewhat baffled that this number makes an appearance here, then you are no different than me. And if you're unaware what the golden ratio is, there's a link with more information in the description below. So at first glance, the golden ratio shouldn't have anything to do with the singularities we are concerned about here. But to understand why it is here, we can dive into the construction of Bath sextic. What was he thinking about whilst constructing this now very famous surface? Well, probably about symmetry and some ancient platonic solids. These regular polygons have been known since antiquity and are classified as platonic solids. They are highly symmetric, so take a look at the dodecahedron for example. If we were to rotate it a little bit a certain way, it looks exactly like it did before. Another reason why we might find these solids so aesthetically pleasing might be their deep relation to the golden ratio. In this colourful picture, you can see this relation displayed nicely. The golden ratio pops up almost every time when a lot of regularity is involved, as in the regular pentagons on screen right now. Since regular polygons are what make up the faces of platonic solids, imagining a connection between the famous ratio and the solids doesn't seem so far-fetched anymore. This isosahedron has six symmetry planes. If we multiply all of those planes together, we get the starting point of the Bath sextic. We can see this shape in Surfer as well. These are the six symmetry planes that you saw before. They all look like disks because Surfer clips big infinite surfaces by a sphere in order to display them. This is not yet what Bath Sextic looks like though. What he did was to subtract a sphere from these planes to construct the singularities. And you can see a little slider on the side. The reason this is here is because Bath hasn't actually just created one sextic, but instead a whole family of them, depending on this little parameter A. And when playing around with it, we can see the shape change in real time. 
if it is just right, some new singularities appear. And there it is, the world record surface. As it turns out, this parameter A has to be deeply connected to the golden ratio, and only then will you get the full 65 singularities. The setup we chose here just shows A from 0 to 1. We can zoom in and out, change colors, and play around with the parameter A. Now if you were able to count all of these double points here, you might notice that there are only 50 singularities, and you might wonder what's going on, since there are supposed to be 65. Well, we're only able to see 50 of them, because the other 15 singularities are hiding at infinity. But maybe what that means can be a topic for another time. A cute thing to realize is that the shape of the dodecahedron is in the sextic, we can see that each of the singularities actually fall on a vertex of that platonic shape. But perhaps that is actually less of a surprise now that we know how Bath's surface was constructed. The shape also has radial symmetry in some sense due to the subtraction of the sphere. I have here a 3D printed Bath sextic. It's not the version with all 65 singularities as that would be pretty unstable and this was hard enough to print as it was, but if you do have access to a 3D printer, there's also a link to this template down in the description. And this leaves us with the future. The best we can do for a polynomial of degree 7 is 99 singularities, but there might be a surface out there of degree 7 with 100 singularities. All it takes is a curious mind to find it, and that search may start with a lesson on Brilliant. Brilliant have kindly sponsored this video, so let's take a look at their quiz on platonic solids, part of their course on 3D geometry. They start by asking how many faces could possibly meet at a single vertex of a three-dimensional shape if all of those faces are squares. Well, a cube is such a shape, and if you look at the corner, you'll see that three faces are able to meet at that vertex. So we can plug in our answer as 3, 2 squares would only fold to make a flat shape, and the 4 squares cannot meet at a single vertex, because there is no space to be able to fold them up. Now there are lots of shapes where every vertex is identical, such as the ones in the pictures here, but we want to consider these shapes with identical vertices that are also made out of only a single kind of regular polygon. So their faces are either all squares or all triangles or all some regular shape. And the shapes with these properties are called platonic solids. What is the largest number of sides a regular polygon can have if three of them meet at a single vertex? This one's a little tricky, but the correct answer is five. A five-sided shape, the pentagon, is the most that can fit on a single vertex. If you look at the picture, that leaves a little bit of room to be able to fold it up. But with the hexagons, they fit together perfectly, leaving no room to be able to fold them. And with the heptagons, which is seven sides, or anything with more sides than that, can't share a vertex because their angles will add to more than 360 degrees. And you can see you've got that little gap left in there that can't be filled. The next question is, which of the following nets of equilateral triangles can fold up successfully to make a vertex of a three-dimensional figure? A won't work because it would just fold over on itself. And E doesn't really work either, unless you want your shape to have a concave part. However, all the others can fold to make a vertex. And so putting it all together, we've found that there are three ways to make a three-dimensional vertex using the equilateral triangles. Those are the ways we just saw. And there's only one way to make a vertex using the squares. That was that three-sided intersection. And we know that a five-sided shape is the maximum that you'd be able to use to make a vertex at all. So there are exactly five ways to arrange regular polygons around a single vertex to form a net that will fold into a three-dimensional shape. And for all five of these cases for the vertices, they can be extended to make the full shape where every vertex is identical. 
that gives us the five platonic solids, the tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the isosahedron. And this course goes on to explore how to think about paths that travel through or on the faces of these polyhedra. If you would like to try out Brilliant for yourself and explore the rest of the course, you can head to brilliant.org slash tibbies, and that link will be on screen and down in the description. Thank you to Brilliant, and also thank you to my Patreon supporters who have made this video possible. A special shout out to today's Patreon Cat of the Day, Phoenix.